everyone. Thank you so much for joining. This is, I think, the greatest turnout that we've had, which is not surprising. Just wanted to give a warm welcome uh, to, to all of you and a special thanks to Wesley, who is organizing these series. And of course, the uh, most special thanks to Kathy. It's wonderful to see you again. Over to Wesley. Thank you, Pinar and Robin. So um, it's my great honor today to introduce Kathy Eisenhower to you. Uh, she is also uh, my committee member. Um, it's the fir very first time me as a professor to introduce Kathy uh, to uh, an official seminar. So Kathy Eisenhower is a Stanford Ashman MD professor at the Department of Management Science and Engineering at Stanford University and a faculty member in the Stanford Technology Ventures program. Professor Eisenhower is the author of over 100 articles in research and business journals, as well as best-selling books, including Competing on the Edge and Simple Rules. Kathy's research focus is strategy and organization, especially in tech-based companies and high-velocity industries environments. She oftentimes uses multi-case theory building methods and more recently uses machine learning for theory theory building as well. She has received numerous top awards from the Academy of Management, SMS, and other organizations, and she is one of the most cited uh, management scholars in the world. So today, Kathy is here to discuss her recent research on strategy in nascent markets using multiple industry contexts. Without further ado, Kathy, take it away. Okay, well, thank you, Wesley. Thank you, Panar, and thank you, Robin. Appreciate uh, SMS having me today. Good morning or good afternoon or good evening, wherever you are. Um, and thank you so much for joining me this morning. Um, what I'm gonna be doing is talking as, as Wesley and Pinar said, uh, strategy in nascent markets um, to you all for a little while this morning. Uh, just to get started, um, I think we have, I, 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 I wanna start with the well-known vignette from Airbnb where the Airbnb founders uh, are a little short on cash, decide to open up their, their apartment for convention goers in pricey San Francisco and have a lot of takers. They have, five, they have several guests the first night. Those guests sleep on air mattresses, get a bagel in the morning, and then they're good to go. And what uh, the founders, uh, Brian Chesky and others, realize is maybe there was an opportunity here for a business. But an opportunity is not a strategy. And it took them another probably two years before they really came up with the strategy of what we now know as, as Airbnb. And so I, I wanna start by just saying is that many entrepreneurs see an opportunity and many strategists see an opportunity, but that doesn't make it a strategy. So what is a strategy? A strategy is a, a set of interdependent activities that create and capture value. More simply, it's how firms and their executives try to win. What about nascent markets? Nascent markets are new markets or disrupted markets. They're characterized by high ambiguity, uncertainty, and velocity. The implication of being new and being in, that, in a nascent market is, is, a, is a dilemma. You want to form a, a strategist wants to form a coherent strategy and you need to think about how the various parts may fit together, but you also need to form a novel strategy in an arena that you've never may, perhaps seen a good strategy. And so the foundations of strategy are simply, um, what we're going to be talking about today is we're going to assume a nascent market we're going to assume that performance is, is initially about surviving, but later about growth and profit. And we're going, to, we're going to be talking broadly about an opportunity logic. So not a resource logic, not a positioning logic, but an opportunity logic where the name of the game is to capture opportunities such as the Airbnb opportunity faster, better, sooner than others. So let's get started. Once again, the dilemma, it's how do you form a coherent strategy uh, by thinking and at the same time form a novel strategy by doing. Let's start with thinking. Thinking. I think you can think about thinking um, from the point of view of sports. So you might think of a point guard or a mid football, which here in the States we call soccer. But that, that particular player sees the broad field, sees, sees the broad court. And that's what the thinking, what, what, a, what a strategist who is thinking well is doing. In particular, we're gonna play, we're gonna pay attention to three aspects of that. Seeing the entire playing field, shaping that playing field, and playing the right game. And by the way, before I, I go on further, I, I do want to thank um, Pinar, Wesley, and, and the other STVP PhD students and faculty who've who've been hugely important to my research. And you're going to see a lot of their research in my talk today. And it's been what I essentially have done is really look through and back at, at the many studies we've done and try to synthesize the common themes in those studies. 
So that's really where sort of the background is. Now I'm going to go to the thinking part. So see the entire field, shape the playing field, play the correct game. To give you a good example of seeing the, the broad view of the strategic playing field, I want to give an example of a study that was that I that I just published with Rory McDonald. Um, Rory and I looked at fintech ventures, about five of those. They all started about the same time. They all started with high quality top management teams that if you looked at those teams, you would think they would all be successful. And we tracked them from their start date to when they had a viable business model. And while we saw a number of insights, one of the major differences in those, those entrepreneurs who were able to successfully form a business model versus those that were unable was their ability to see the entire field. What kind of fintech managers were these? First of all, they were what was known as social investing. They were, that is, they were, they were ventures that combined social networks like Facebook with investing. And so the idea behind these ventures was that amateurs would get on the platform and invest together and share tips and, and become better investors and make more money and, and disintermediate uh, companies like Merrill Lynch, for example. What the, what, while there were a number of insights, the major, one of the major ones was this idea of parallel play. Parallel play refers to, as if you know parallel play and you're a parent, um, it, it refers to how little kids play, how four-year-olds play. And what we observed was that the top entrepreneurs played next to each other like four-year-olds do, not with each other. And they didn't really think about their peers as rivals. So what they did was try to learn about the market. And if they did look at rivalry, they saw rivals as their established substitutes. So instead of focusing narrowly on peers, they focused broadly on the entire market and in particular focused their attention on being better than established substitutes like UBS, like Merrill Lynch, like JP Morgan. Another example of looking at the broad strategic playing field is, is a more, it may not look more recent in the, in the date of the paper, but it is a more recent paper. This paper is on online fashion, and it's looking at three pairs of firms with different online fashion models. So ways in which you can buy clothing online, other than just as, a, as a, another channel. So think of companies, for example, like Stitch Fix or Rent the Runway. Here we had pairs of firms, one of, all of which grew, but only some of which continued to grow and were profitable. And what we realized was that those, those entrepreneurs were able to grow their firm, did an although the business models were different, pursued the same strategy. And that strategy was they took probably two, twice as long as their paired not so successful company uh, to actually design the simple profitable core transaction. That is, they looked at the entire transaction and tried to develop a core transaction that was both simple and was profitable. So they had profitable unit economics or it looked like they would have profitable unit economics. So that meant getting sales tax right, getting shipping right, um, getting other aspects of the business model correct so that you had a core transaction that was ultimately simpler and profit more profitable. By contrast, the less successful firms primarily honed in on product market fit, did not particularly pay attention to having a simple transaction. In fact, they often had complicated transactions and the, the core transaction was unlikely to ever be profitable. And so they rushed to growth, they grew faster, but then stalled because they never, they never found the profitable unit economics. And so the point is again, like the point in the study with Rory, is that these entrepreneurs um, look, at a more look, at a, look at a broader field and a more complicated worldview. Second thing that the top, um, the top firms were doing that we looked at was shaping that strategic playing, playing field. So seeing not only seeing a more complicated or more comprehensive field, but also see, also shaping that to their advantage. So a great example is a study that, that I did with Philippe Santos, uh, it's Philippe led, it was part of his dissertation. And here he looked at, at, at five firms that were all internet stars, if you will, firms that, that are household names at this point. And what we try to understand is how do they go about shaping their boundaries when they began? And what we realized is that the better entrepreneurs created an industry structure that was attractive for them. They did that by, for example, alliances with, with potential large firm rivals, so that those rivals wouldn't come in, or they did acquisitions to take rival peers off the playing field. So they shaped the industry structure to their advantage.
Another example is actually something, a, a, a study with Pinar. Pinar is actually also Pinar's dissertation, so she's, she gets credit for the work here. But we looked at mobile gaming as mobile gaming was becoming an important new market. So how do you play mobile game? How do you play games on your phone? And here the interesting challenge was, we, and we focused on, on entrepreneurial developers. And here the challenge was, how do you put together an ecosystem that, or industry architecture? How do you get carriers like, um, like British Telecom? How do you get um, brand owners? How do you get software? How do you get developers? About five, five or so actors actually have to come together into the ecosystem to make it work. And what we found, um, and in particular Pinar found, was that the better entrepreneurs, the successfully created industry architecture, had a vision of that architecture and then went about assembling the entire ecosystem. By contrast, the entrepreneurs who were less successful focused primarily on developing a great game, but they didn't really have the rest of the interest, the rest of the ecosystem in, in, in view. I'll just say briefly about personal genomics. That final point I just wanted to make is, uh, I've been talking about shaping the, the industry structure itself. It's also about shaping the cognitive understanding. And so this particular study, which I can send if anybody's interested is on personal genomics, where, where companies like 23andMe actually create the category. The third point is really the idea of playing the correct game. I think one of the things that, that I've noticed over a number of studies, and that I don't think ever gets mentioned very often, is un the, the importance of understanding the underlying economics of the game. Uh, so in fact, taking the game theory metaphor seriously and realizing that the game of, for example, ecosystems is not the same game as a physical product. And so understanding the game that's being played. So just as you wouldn't play the same game with the same, just, just as playing basketball is not playing tennis, uh, playing ecosystems is not the same as a phys physical product. The game is different and the underlying strategies by which you win are different. The example here is, is, is work with Doug, Doug Hanna on the residential solar industry. We looked at it, this was now a disrupted market. Um, and what we looked at were how different entrepreneurs tried to, tried to build a strategy and form an ecosystem. What's interesting, I think particularly about this study is that there are several different successful strategies. So like many games, there are more ways, there are multiple strategies by which you can win. So if you know the old game hearts, you can win by shooting the moon or you can win by trying to get rid of the hearts. Well, ecosystems are like that too. You can play a system strategy, uh, which is which having the entire ecosystem under your control. You can play a component strategy where you focus on a particular component, or you can play what, what was the new strategy we saw, which was the bottleneck strategy, where you move from bottleneck to bottleneck as the, as the ecosystem builds. Um, by contrast, while there are certainly, the, while well, the point is there are multiple ways to be successful, there are, not all strategies are. So for example, if a strategy of solely focusing on your product and missing the ecosystem is not, or being in multiple components, um, sort of it's like, it's like tennis when you, when you don't want to buy, buy the net, but you don't want to be back. We don't want to be at multiple components. You either want to have control of them all, or you want to control one or maybe two. But in between is a, is a strategy that's extremely difficult to make to make work. Conversely, a different market, a different game is the two-sided marketplace. Think of Airbnb, Uber, Etsy as classic two-sided marketplaces. This, the rules of how you, the strategy for building a marketplace is not the same as an ecosystem. What we found in looking at, at three pairs of marketplaces, one marketplace that succeeded, one failed, Across those three successful marketplaces, each of them began with what they perceived as that core, the core bottleneck of the, of, of the marketplace. Typically that was supply. And they, they went in an order, supply, demand, geography, uh, and then inserted the platform kind of wherever it made sense. So there were really four facets you had to make work. And there was, there was a particular order that, that was more successful to go in, uh, which largely related to what was the critical bottleneck at the time. The other thing that was interesting about this, this strategy is that it was, it was effective to focus on one bottleneck at a time. So for example, focus on supply, figure out supply, who's the supply, often, often build a, a repeatable formula, simple rules, and then pause before scaling that strategy. Go to the next bottleneck, for example, demand, figure out how to resolve demand, then go to the next bottleneck. And then when the, when the entrepreneur had all of the bottlenecks figured out, it was then time to scale. 
And that was the way you would build a marketplace. But that's not the same game as you would play if it's a complex novel product. This is a study where we compared DJI, the, the uh, Chinese uh, powerhouse in drones at this point, and 3DR, uh, which is a US firm. Both firms started at the same time. They were building a complex novel product, so a much different challenge than an ecosystem, much different challenge than a marketplace. They were building a very technically difficult, complicated product. And that, that, that strategy had to do with doing things like figuring out the dominant design, finding product market fit. Actually, I got a couple of, I think I'll skip this and move on. Um, but the idea broadly is seeing, so let me just reprise where I was, see the entire playing field, pay attention, especially to substitutes, pay attention, especially to the entire core transaction. Shape the playing field to your advantage and play the right game. Know the strategic moves, resolve the right bottlenecks. What's new? What I think there are, there are multiple things that new, but certainly one I think that's most striking is this idea of your, 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 your peers are not your rivals, it's your substitutes. Rivals are a source of ideas that you copy, um, substitutes who you're actually who you're competing against. And so this is different, very different from, I think, a differentiated positioning strategy. Second, I think, thing that's new, idea that's new is the idea that alliances and acquisitions are used, being used to shape the industry structure. Whereas from RBV perspective, they would be about gaining resources. Sure, you might get gain resources, but the more important driver is shaping the structure to your advantage. And then finally, this idea of thinking, not just doing, understanding what is the correct game to play. And not just, for example, as we would in Lean Startup, simply pushing ahead. Okay, that's, that's sort of the thinking side. Let's go to the doing side. What do we mean by doing? Um, three points again that I wanna make. Uh, doing, so it's not just thinking, but it's also doing. The repertoire of learning processes, variety of learning processes, really introducing timing into the strategic equation. So strategy, in, just as you would in, in any kind of a sports game, has a timing element to it. Well, strategy has a timing element to it here. And then finally, the idea of the right problem solving approach. One of the things we don't talk about a lot in the literature is how do you actually organize that learning? And that's what problem solving is about. So let me give you a couple of examples and hopefully explain that to you, what I'm talking about. First of all, learning repertoire. Uh, in the, study, in, the, in the study that Tim Ott did on two-sided marketplaces, one of the features of that was that he certainly saw entrepreneurs experimenting, but he also saw the synergy of that with trial and error. So trial and error was in some sense giving serendipitous insights while the experimentation was then focusing in the key uncertainties of those insights and learning about those, those insights. So I think it's become, you know, experimentation has become popular lately in the literature um, it's something that we've that I that I've probably seen for 20 years in pretty much any study we do in nascent markets. Experimentation is always important, um, but what I think this this study really shows is the interplay between trial and error and experimentation. Why both of them are actually valuable. Another idea on learning <clears throat> comes from the study with Rory McDonald at the FinTech Ventures. Remember, they were the ones that were trying to do social investing where amateurs would help each other out and become rich, which turns out to be overly optimistic. But um, <clears throat> in any event, <clears throat> excuse me, what, we were, what we were looking at was how they figured out their business models. Experimentation was certainly important about resolving uncertainties, particularly around core uncertainties around the business model. These firms were considering two business models. Uh, one was a, a fairly standard advertising-based model where the, this, the amateur investors would be on the portal and there would be ads shown to them. The other business model involved actually trading on the platform. And for that, at least in the States, one needs SEC approval, so Securities and Exchange Commission approval. A potentially more valuable strategy, um, but also a more difficult strategy. And so what Rory found was that uh, entrepreneurs uh, experimented with the core uncertainties of that strategy. For example, would people actually trade online uh, and how would they do it? The second thing that we saw in terms of learning though was also how important imitation was. That the better entrepreneurs, just like little kids, had no qualms with copying their peers. If a peer had a good user interface, they were perfectly willing to, 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 to copy it rather than worrying about differentiation. 
Indeed, worrying about differentiation was largely costly. It took too much time to do to, to too many resources. So there was a lot of imitation going on. And then the final learning strategy that we saw that I think was also particularly interesting was what we call passive learning where you have a partial a partially running business you have a partial the business is running but the but but you know the business model isn't quite right and you just let the business run and you watch and see what happens so you actually stop doing anything pause and see how in this case the marketplace played out kathy yeah. we have one question from nicholas right here and his question okay. is on timing, what have studies shown about the difference between affecting whether opportune moments happen versus responding to opportune moments that happen? Uh, I think I'm going to hang on to that one and, and, and do that one later. Can you hang on to it, Wesley? Of course. All right. Let me, because I'm going to talk about timing next. Um, let me just wrap up learning. Um, in the study of DJI and 3DR, again, that was drones, a very complex, you've, you've seen those quad rudder drones probably flying around, um, a, a very complex product that has to put together um, a variety of technical dif disciplines, if you think about it. It's, it's computer science, it's mechanical engineering, it's electronics, uh, it's aeronautics, it's radar, or not radar, but, but um, communication, telecom. Uh, and so, what we saw in that study is, is, is the ways in which a sophisticated company, particularly like TJI, experiments in a variety of ways. Parallel experimentation, um, for example, doing running multiple projects at once uh, versus uh, serial experimentation and rapid, rapid prototyping. So DJI was a, one of the interesting points of that paper is the degree to which DJI was a master of a variety of, of experimentation strategies, individual experimentation, um, as well as serial and parallel experimentation. I mean, on, on timing, I think I'm going to wait till the very end on that that that, that question, Wesley, because that was a that was a pretty overarching question. So I may kind of roll to the end. Um, the next point I want to talk about on doing is strategic timing. This is a study, and I, as I said before, in strategy, we surprisingly don't think about much much about timing. Even though if one were playing uh, European football, soccer to us in the States, or one was playing tennis, or one's playing chess, or one playing basketball, timing, fast, slow, rhythm is incredibly important. And yet we, we don't talk about it in, in, in the strategy world very often. In this particular study, Eric Vollmer, who's a current PhD student and, and wrapping up his dissertation, is studying online education, platforms like, um, like Udacity, or, um, for example, um, and, and what he realized is that in this market, um, <clears throat> which is a highly institutionalized market, it's, it's a market, in, in the particular market he's looking at is university education. So disruptors to university education using, for example, MOOCs. Um, what he realizes there, there are really two ways to play that strategy. One is to play within the, the existing ecosystem of universities. The other is to really pivot away from the universities and go to a different market that doesn't require universities. And for example, offers postgraduate education to professionals. And what he observed is depending upon the path that one took, you would either have a fast strategy or a strategy that was much slower. In particular, those firms that chose to work with universities had to actually slow down the pace of their action and bring the universities along with them. So slow down, co-evolve, uh, negotiate, uh, form relationships is a much different strategic process and a much slower strategic process than the strategy of the firms that chose to pivot away from the university environment and go out on their own, where they could follow a much faster um, strategy of learning, learning, experimenting, testing, moving on, and honing the strategy. So depending upon the strategy, it was either a slow strategy or a fast strategy. That same idea of slow and fast is in the online fashion study that I told you about, the one that was about companies similar to Red the Runway or, or Stitch Fix, um, where, they were, where, they, where I, I mentioned that the better entrepreneurs were seeing a bigger core transaction. Um, <clears throat> in contrast, what we were seeing, what, what we saw in this study was, or what we saw, was that the better entrepreneurs took time and actually were more slowly learned about the bigger core transaction and, and took probably twice as long to scale as the firms that moved quickly to learn. 
So learning slowly, understanding the unit economics, making them profitable and simple uh, took time. And what these, what these entrepreneurs also did in order to have the time is they explicitly stopped their growth. So they actually paused, and dialed back growth in order to learn. Once they'd learned, they could then scale rapidly on the scaffold of profitable unit economics. By contrast, the less successful firms um, did less of that. Um, and in fact, went much more quickly to growing, to product market fit, and to what, what we were terming growth hacks. Growth hacks being things like, you've got kind of a product that's working and you do a growth hack like I advertise on Facebook or do some sort of viral marketing campaign. That's timing. And finally, I, I told you a little bit about, just before I won't repeat it, but about, about the FinTech study where people were actually pausing, stopping and passively learning. So instead of just rushing ahead all the time, actually stopping, pausing and watching the world around them to see what was going to go on. And finally, the marketplace um, had rhythm to it. So pausing at platforms and then also building out repeatable formulas that were rhythmic. So many new countries per, per year or per month or per six months, so many um, adding so many suppliers at once. So there were often were, were, as these entrepreneurs built their platform, built their marketplaces and built their, their strategies, they were often building strategies that were repeatable formulas of simple rules. How to, how, to, how to add suppliers, how to add demand, how to add geographies. And many times those had rhythms to them. So many, so many suppliers at, at a time, so many buyers at a time and so on. The final idea is around this idea of problem solving approaches. I think we all know that learning is important, but what I don't think we look at so much is the organization of how we learn, how and where we learn. Uh, and that matters in strategy in new markets. For example, in the two-sided marketplace study, um, what we saw was what, a process that we call decision weaving. Um, and I explained it to you before, it was about, about focusing on a particular part of the strategy, for example, supply, getting that right, hitting a, hitting a plateau, and then going to the, the next part of the strategy, let's say demand. If you abstract more, more and above a marketplace, what that is, is, is the way in which you solve a complex novel problem. If a problem is just com if the problem is just complex, you can solve it, but not novel. You can actually solve it modularly. If it's novel, but not complicated, you can use an integrative problem solving strategy. But when it's a novel complex problem, you actually have to see, you have to use a very unique strategy. And it's typically focusing on a module of the problem while, the, while keeping the rest of it in mind and stepping through finding plateaus. We saw that even more so in DJI and 3DR, the drones. What, we, what, what that study is, was, was a study that compares DJI, which is a firm, with 3DR, which used user, a user community of drone enthusiasts to be the, um, uh, to be the innovation team. So it's, it, the, the underlying, the, the community was DIY.drones, a DIY drones was a community of, depending on when you looked, 20, 30, 40,000 people. Uh, but a small cadre of core community members were very engaged in developing products, which 3DR would then make. What we saw in this study was the progression from when these firms both started to when they figured out the dominant design to when they figured out successive product market fits. The dominant design was one that could, it was actually a fairly modular problem solving approach, um, which the community was particularly good at doing. Lots of individuals experimenting around the world, coming up with the idea of the quad rotor, a quad rotor that no one was really looking for, but, but turned out to be the breakthrough design. So the community was very good at individual experimentation. The community was very good at modular problem solving. But when it came to actually putting together a drone that was not a kit, because initially these were all kits. And so you as a user would get a, a kit of drone parts and then you would get out your soldering iron and you'd put it together. Well, it turns out for the mass market, I mean, who owns a soldering iron? You know, my brother did it, but I don't think many people do. Um, and so for the mass market, they actually needed a drone that was, as they called it, ready to fly, RTF, ready to fly out of the box. And that was a much more integrative, complex and novel problem. And the user community simply didn't have the coordination and didn't have the coordinated talent to be able to do that in the way that the firm could do. 
Kathy, uh, would you take a pause to answer some questions right now? We have uh, several questions piled up. Several questions piled up. Um, yeah. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm one slide to the end. How's it? Okay. Yep. So why don't I just get to the end and then, then I'll, can I come back and all actually right. see you all? Or maybe I should. You want me to stop? I'll stop. Sure. Go ahead. Ask me. Ask me the question. It's really up to you. Uh, there is one question that's very relevant uh, to the DJI example. Uh, yeah. Henson is asking, uh, how how is basically the DJI's experimentation related to exploration and exploitation? Uh, how is it related to exploration and exploitation? Uh, I would say that that the experimentation at at uh, 3DR was more related to explore, exploration. You had a it was the situation of 20, 30, 40,000 community members out there all experimenting. Many of them were just sort of weekend drone flyers, but some of them were, were technically experimenting. So that was a much more exploration kind of way of, of experimenting. Uh, DJI, I wouldn't call it, I don't think exploration exploitation is really quite the right dichotomy um, because what DJI was able to do was focus on key, key uncertainties. Once, once the community actually had figured out the quad rotor design, DJI copied it um, and, and so did everybody else. It wasn't that DJI was copying particularly. Uh, but then after that, DJI was much more into understanding what are the core uncertainties that we have to resolve. First was product market fit. For example, the, the question, once it, once it became apparent that the quad rotor was the design and that drones were an interesting technology, um, venture capitalists and these entrepreneurs started to realize that there was a big opportunity in drones. And so, but, but as, as the question that, that was being asked in, the, in those firms and in those VC boardrooms, it was, so what do we do with a drone? In fact, we're still to some extent asking, what do we do with a drone? And so what DJI did much more systematically was uh, figure out what, what, what you do with the drone. <clears throat> and in particular, what they did was, was go in a systematic fashion into the US and into Europe, which they saw as the big markets, and go to trade shows, find users, so farmers, farm trade show, fire safety trade show, mining, and so on, to figure out what was, what was the killer app. And so it was, a parallel, it was a parallel experimentation in trade shows, to which they found out the killer app was in fact video. And then once you realize it's video, then you realize you need to build a Kimball, which is a very integrative product. It's a very difficult, it's small, um, but, and, but it's very difficult to design. It's, a very, it's, it's technically temperamental. Once they had the gimbal, then they realized, and both firms did, and, and the industry realized, we actually needed the ready-to-fly drone, which is the drone out of a box that you think of today as opposed to a kit, parts kit. And that was, again, designed by resolving, un, resolving critical uncertainties uh, while being able to have the drone flying at all times. So for example, one of the interesting things that DJI did was they always had a drone that would work. Um, uh, it was ready to fly, uh, made out of component, made, made out of off-the-shelf components. Um, but sometimes it was not, it, it was never, it was not a very good drone. And so we go step by step through the different components and redesign those, but always having a drone that worked. So that's really the process. And I don't think you'd call that exploitation and I don't think you'd call that ex exploration. It was, it was basically building, it was basically product, product innovation. And so I don't think that explore exploit makes sense, at least it didn't at the time of the study. They may now be in exploitation mode where developing, for example, once they had, the, this is our DJI, once they had the ready to fly drone, then they were doing exploitation like a more expensive drone, a less featured drone, a more portable drone uh, and so on. Um, so they got into ex exploitation mode, but I don't know the ex exploration was really that really captured this this middle phase very well. I don't think that, I don't think that dichotomy captures it. It's, it's like there's a missing middle in that dichotomy. There's a another question: business models. Do you want me to answer it right now or answer later? Oh, okay. All right. So Stefan has a question on the business model, specifically in your paper with Rory, where you talk about uh, business model pro processes. Uh -huh. uh, and his question is pretty general. He's asking, what's your opinion or what's your view on the business model concepts? and whether it's a useful construct in management research. Uh, if I may rephrase this question a little bit, maybe in relation to your talk, um, uh, how is business model as a concept? Or one is effective, or one is useful, one is not? Yeah, I think, I think um, the business model is, is a very useful concept in, in, in new markets um, and for entrepreneurs. 
uh, <clears throat> because the business model is, I, I think it's, I think, I think we're all still trying to relate exactly what's strategy and what's business model, but certainly finding a business model is a huge part of strategy in, in nascent markets. Um, because that is where you figure out the core economics, for example, the core unit economics. Um, in the case of the study with Rory, it was the choice between are we an ad supported business or are we SEC, SEC approved actual real trading? And that was a, that was a very big distinction uh, to make. Uh, and so then, then, and then going forward, I think the entrepreneurs then started to figure out things. Once, once you have that, that business model set and you're starting to scale it, um, then you can start thinking in terms of differentiation against peers and so on. But early on, I think what on, many entrepreneurs are doing, particularly if the business model is not obvious, is they are figuring out the business model. If I were to contrast the study with Rory on social investing versus 3DR and DJI, the business model was never really in doubt in DJI and 3DR. It's a physical product. We all know what the business model is. Initially, 3DR did have a, a user community centric business model, but it's basically it's it's basically the, the, the classic value chain business model of you design a you design a product, you manufacture it, and you sell it. So the business model wasn't particularly interesting there. But for for settings like social investing, like online fashion. Um, like actually uh, Panar's work on mobile gaming, the business model was not obvious and finding that business model early on is, is, a, is a critical part of strategy. Thank, thank you, Stefan. So there are a few more questions, but uh, there are more general questions. Maybe we uh, let you finish first and you can take those questions uh, Just take end. me, maybe take me 30 seconds guys and I'll, and I'll be with you. Yeah, please. Yeah. Um, yeah, so just, just to wrap up, um, I was in the doing, doing mode there. What I wanted to emphasize was really three critical points. The idea that experimentation in all its flavors is important. And certainly <clears throat> the, the current interest in that is exciting. But trial and error, passive imitation, and bricolage are all learning processes. And in my experience, looking a bunch across a number of studies, sophisticated, successful entrepreneurs are able to leverage all of those learning processes contingently. The second point is the idea of strategic timing, going fast, going slow, pressing pause, finding rhythm. It's again, uh, an important facet of, of a successful strategy. And then finally, the right problem solving strategy. How do you actually organize how you're going to learn? So what's new? What's new is it's, it's a repertoire of learning. So it's not just thinking, which you know, positioning is largely a thinking perspective. It's not just thinking, it's doing. And it's not just even experimentation. It's a variety of other methods. It's strategic timing, whereas I think in much of strategy, we think about first mover, but strategic timing is so much more than first mover. And then finally problem solving beyond just learning to actually organizing that learning. So, so in summary, superior strategy in nascent markets combines thinking and doing. Um, and that's that. Uh, can, I, can I get out of this and go see the, see the audience or is that my going to mess things up? Uh, feel free to do that. You, uh, you can unshare your screen, yeah. I think, right. then you can see the audience. Screen. Yeah, um, yeah so folks, uh, what we're gonna do right now, we have uh, four questions uh, in the chat right now, but instead of uh, uh, people typing into the Q&A function, maybe let's have, have a more interactive session in the sense that I can unmute people if you want to ask questions. So let's go in the order of the questions listed so far. Uh, Fatiro, if you're here, I am going to try to find you and unmute you so that you can ask your questions. Uh, Fatiro, I, I just admitted you, Fatiro. Oh, and nobody's got their video on either, do they? Oh, so that's what's yeah. happening. Oh, they can put their videos on if they want, can they? Fatiro, do you want to ask your question? Hi, uh, could you hear me, Kathleen? I can, absolutely. Oh yeah, thank you. I just curious how, if you see the difference between incumbent versus new ventures in navigating the nascent markets. Is there any differences in terms of how they uh, do like the strategic timing and learning? Do you see something like that? I don't, I don't see a lot of difference. I think what I think what incumbents or, or established firms do is they move more slowly because they can, because they already have an existing business. And so in my experience, what, what they will do is they will they will wait and they will see what happens and then maybe go in. But certainly the ideas that I've talked about this morning don't really have, um, 
are not really related to the size of the firm. So they aren't related mm -hmm. to resources or so on. They're related more to the nature of the market, the market being mm -hmm. uh, ambiguous, uncertain, novel. And so that's really what um, my tech is coming in. Um, that's really what's going on is, is, is about the market, not, not about the size of the firm. Okay, thank you. All right, so next up we have Nicholas. Uh, Nicholas, you have two questions. Uh, maybe I suggest you can combine the two into one question. I am going to unmute you right now. Hi, Nicholas. Hi, thank you for the presentation. I, I have um, a question about this, the combination of trial and error and strategic timing. Yeah. So the, the trial and error approach implies to me an evolutionary approach where you don't have a lot of control over the outcome. So you're trying a lot of things, you're letting errors kind of go away and you're taking advantage of things that work. Whereas the strategic timing approach implies to me a bit more control over outcomes. Is that tension, is that the tension that's there or am I seeing this incorrectly? And if, if there is a tension there, do some markets have different degrees of control over outcomes than others? Well, well I, maybe you could explain to me what you mean by strategic timing. I'm not quite sure I, I know what you mean. Uh, so I, I think I'm picking up on just the idea that it, yeah, if, if timing matters yep. to an entrepreneur in the sense that they can create an opportune moment for themselves yep. or whether they instead respond to events that happen outside their control in a way that's better than other entrepreneurs do. I, I, think, it's, I think it's very hard if you're talking about like timing the entry into a market, I think that's very hard to do. Just like it's hard to time the stock market it's hard to time market entry. That's something that established firms actually can do because they can wait. I think for entrepreneurs, it's it's hard to do an, an entry timing. Uh, I think what what I meant by 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 um, trial and error and by experimentation in particular was that trial and error trial and error sort of happens because you just don't know enough, you're just doing things. It's not so much you have this evolutionary strategy that you're doing, it's just you're doing things and you make mistakes and you realize you're making a mistake. And the synergy with experimentation is then if you make a mistake and you realize the new thing to do, um, you may want to experiment around that. So for example, uh, to use Airbnb, um, there was a lot of experimentation around who can be a host. Um, and they, they started, you know, sort of, well, they started doing a lot of trial and error, let's try these people, let's try those people realizing then that, that the, the kinds of hosts they wanted were, were actually people like you and me as opposed to professional hosts. And then realized, well, I wonder how we can get more people on the site and started using photography. And they realized, oh, hey, photography may matter. You know, grid pictures about these, these uh, apartments or houses uh, would be useful. And once seeing, oh, it's photography, then they started doing experiments around what kinds of photography and, and demonstrating that, that photography worked. So there's an interplay. So I was talking about the interplay between um, just doing things, which you, you, which you have to do. I mean, there's no way not, there's no way not to do ex uh, trial and error and, and experimentation. Timing then has more to do, at least in, in my world, with, with the pace at which you're moving. How fast or slow are you, mm -hmm. you want to use landscape metaphor, how fast are you trying to go through the landscape? And that there are times when it's to your advantage to go slowly. And I don't think that, for example, perspectives like Lean Startup I, I'm, a, I'm a big lean, first of all, I'll say I'm a big lean startup fan, but I also think it's too simple. And it doesn't really capture the degree to which you sometimes want to slow, slow down, where there's an advantage to slow down, where there's an advantage even to stopping. Does that make sense, Nicholas? Yeah, thank you. I, I think I hadn't realized the connection to pacing with strategic timing. So yes. that, that helps clarify it quite a bit. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Sure. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have uh, Wafa. I'm going to meet you, Wafa. One second, I have to find the name first. By the way, uh, Wafa is uh, one of the PhD students who is leading our effort at organizing several PhD related events. So please um, be on the lookout for that. Okay, but where, where are you located? At the University of Oregon. Uh, oh, okay, so just up the way. Yep, yep, exactly. Yeah, thanks for, for a great presentation. Um, I was just uh, thinking of, uh, uh, I, I'm sure. I'm sure this is. Uh, I've read some of the papers you presented, that the ones that are published at least, and uh, I know there is like kind of a connection or an interaction between 
uh, strategic timing and strategic thinking. Like if you, you're pacing, you're probably thinking more, but if you're going fast, you're probably trying an error. But I don't really, I, I was just wondering if you could talk about that connection a little more or that interaction. If like we think of it in a kind of a two by two way, like how these two dimension of strategy uh, relate together in nascent markets. Uh, how how thinking and how 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 thinking and and pacing work together? Yeah, I think I think because I think I think it is. I hadn't been thinking about it too much, but I think there is certainly there's there's a conscious understanding of I need to slow down because I need to think more. For example, about what are the profitable unit economics, or I need to slow down um, because I have because I'm in an institutional market like healthcare or universities education, where I have to actually slow down because I have to co-evolve with institutional partners that are typically resistant to change and slow moving. So I think there is, there, I, I think the, 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 the slowing down, the speeding up, the getting into the rhythm, I think is very much a conscious choice. And people are thinking, and what I think perhaps makes more successful entrepreneurs a part of what's going on is they are thinking more broadly and they are thinking about time as a dimension of their strategy. Whereas other entrepreneurs that I've seen are mostly just going forward and developing a product as fast as they can and not thinking through the timing of what they're doing. That, 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 that makes sense, yeah. So, so the two are really kind of correlated together, the, those two dimensions of- Yes, uh -huh. yeah. yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, next up we have Paula. Go ahead, Paula. Hello. Hello, Paula. Thank you for your presentation. Mm -hmm. um, I think um, much of what I asked is already been answered. I was asking you if you thought that timing and pacing were key aspects, in, especially in na nascent markets. Mm -hmm. And whether you had crossed some, into some evidence that pointed out that slow strategies were unsuitable for this environment or no, what is your thinking? Are, is, is I, I, I think a that, that good way to go? <laughs> I, I, think, I think my point of view is that, is that timing is part of strategy. And so it's something that one thinks about. So being slow or being fast per se isn't good or bad. It's it's when to be slow and when to be fast and what are you being slow for? So for example, in, in our new work on online fashion, that slowing down to learn to learn about the entire transaction and make it simple and profitable is time well spent. In fact, we use a, a, a sewing metaphor, the uh, uh, measure twice, cut once, if you know that, or that's probably, I guess maybe that's carpentry too. Um, but I, I, it's, it's more seeing time as a strategic variable that, that, that's part of what you think about. Not just as, you know, differentiation isn't always a great strategy. Sometimes you want to be a cost leader. It's, 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 it's more about, it's, it's, it's a lever that you should be conscious of. Great, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, taking all together what you just told. Okay, great. And let's say I'll, I'll, I'll now make my short answer shorter too. Thank you, Paula. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we have Louis. Uh, we have uh, Luz Rivas. Oh, hello, Luis. I think you're someone I know. I uh, I just admitted you, Luz. Go ahead. Okay. Hi. Hello, Kathy. Uh, hi. Actually, I don't know that I know you, but 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 uh, hello. Thanks for thanks for listening. I've been following following you from long time ago. Oh, <laughs> I would that... like, I would like to know why. Is it that you refer to superior strategy and what is the difference with just strategy? Oh, superior strategy. Well, one of the, one of the good things about studying nascent markets is superior strategies fairly easy to see because um, you can see usually, usually in these studies, um, one firm goes on and, and you know, several firms, the superior strategists, if you will, succeeded because they had a better strategy and go forward and, and grow and prosper and so on. And the firms that don't um, typically had a poor strategy and they fit and they die. So you can really very clearly see companies that survive and companies that don't. Okay. So in the online fashion study, we saw all six of the companies we studied were actually got substantial venture capital, did well for a while, 
but the three that took the time to learn the core transaction, then did some other things. I mean, there's more to the paper than just that. Um, developed strategies that went on, they, they, are, they, they were profitable, they had IPOs and so on, whereas the ones that didn't went out of business. So, it's, so that's what I mean is, the, and, and whether or not one can attribute uh, succeeding and growing and scaling to a strategy versus one can, or to some other, some other factor. Okay, thank you so much. It is so yeah, thank, thank you, Liz. Okay. Uh, next up, we have Stefan. Um, so maybe Stefan, can you maybe introduce uh, your school as well? So say your name and introduce the school as well. I'm, I'm uh, muting you right now. Hi, Stefan. Good morning. Hi. Or you're probably not good morning where you are. Yeah, I'm based in Scotland at the University of Glasgow. Mm -hmm. um, as strategy scholars, we traditionally focus on their target of imitation rather than the imitator. So we, we study the innovator and dismiss uh, the imitator as a cheap copycat. However, in your studies, you clearly show the potential of imitation. Mm -hmm. So my question is, as strategy scholars, do we need to pay more attention to imitation and its underlying mechanisms? Uh, I think we do. Yes, I think we do. And I think, I think um... Certainly in nascent markets where, where a lot of forming strategies around learning, if, you're, if, you're, if your peer has learned something, you may as well learn that too. Um, and in fact, as, we, as, as Rory and I saw, it was your true, your true competition is not, your, is not your entrepreneurial rivals because they're as small and insignificant like you are. Your real competition is established money managers like JP Morgan. That's your real competition. And so if you happen to be copying from your peers or from JP Morgan, and it saves you time and it saves you money, it's to your advantage to copy. So yes, I think that's a great research area. When to, when to imitate and when not, and how to imitate. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Stefan. Yeah, next up, we'll, uh, we'll have Jonathan. Jonathan, would you okay. unmute? Um, hi, Kathy. Um, I'm interested to learn more about um, the interaction between the thinking and doing, but when there's constrained resources. So not every firm can take the decisions um, or implement the experimentations that they would like, because, for example, they don't have access to human talent or financial resources. So mm -hmm. could you speak to that a little bit? Um. Let's see. When you don't have resources, yeah. I, I mean, I, I think um, I think they both still play out. Obviously, the degree to which you can spend money if you don't have resources is, is constrained. But and perhaps one has to do more bootstrapping. But in general, what I, I mean, actually, actually, a really interesting paper on this um, is is a paper in ASQ by by Tiona Zazul and Mary Tripsis that looks at the air taxi industry uh, and a couple of players that are highly funded. These are, new, these are all new companies, highly funded, and some that are not. And the way in which the less well-funded entrepreneurs are, are thinking, because they are thinking, where are, we going to, where are we spending our resources? Where are we going to have put redundancies, the uncertainties? But they're also doing. So they are, they are thinking and doing. In fact, if anything, you may have to think more if you are, if you are, a, if are, if you are a, a, a under-resourced firm because you don't have the money to spend. And so you do have to think more carefully about well, where am I going to spend? Um, what, you know, how am, I, how am I going to develop my strategy when I don't have a lot of money? How am I going to learn if I don't have a lot of money? So I think thinking and doing becomes potentially, if anything, more important if, if you're an under-resourced firm because you don't have the luxury of being careless. I hope that makes sense, Jonathan. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, Sam, would you unmute and ask a question? And maybe you can introduce your school as well. Uh, hi, can you hear me? I can, Sam. Thank you. Yes. Yes, uh, my name is Sam and I'm from uh, Jönköping International Business School in Sweden. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, presentation. Um, you mentioned that uh, the established firm, as you, you see, and the um, and the startup probably they don't have that much different except that incumbents can wait. Do you see more observation between the incumbents and the startups in terms of uh, um, the context of market change? Um, 
I'm, I'm, I'm focused mostly on, on, on new markets. I haven't done too much on, on markets that are more stable lately. Um, certainly the, when markets are more stable, the incumbents have, have definitely have an advantage. And I don't think it's even a particularly good place for entrepreneurs. Uh, you, if you're talking about a more stable market, you have to be it uh, around the niches or you have to have perhaps a really fabulous technology and perhaps you can, you can um, be, be acquired. But I think the playground of, of the nascent market playground is the place where, where entrepreneurs are. Uh, whereas established markets, I think that's where the, obviously the established players are. And it's very hard to beat them in that market. So that's what I, I would say to that. Hope that helps. Very much. Thank you. All right, folks, we have one last question. We have time for one last question. Uh, if you have a question, please raise your hand. Last call. Cool. Okay, we have, uh, yeah, we have a winner uh, from uh, Saurabh. Saurabh, I am going to allow you to talk. Hello, good morning. Uh, I'm Saurabh. Can I hear? Can you hear me? I can, Saurabh. Thanks for thanks for tuning in. And uh, thanks for your great presentation. Um, I really enjoyed it. I'm Saurabh from Louisiana State University, and I thought this would be a good last question because uh, it's probably more relevant to your last slides. Um, so I'm wondering what is new here in terms of um, so strategy in nascent market, how fundamentally or uniquely it is different from strategy in non-nascent or mature market. Um, so if you want to list fundamental differences between the strategy in mature versus nascent market, what mm -hmm. would be those? Because so many of the stuff that you talk, I still think that in mature market, people should probably adopt in their strategy thinking and doing, mm -hmm. I'm wondering what are the differences? I would say it's, it's, it's differentiation. Differentiation is a core strategy in established markets. It's not really very relevant in a new market. So differentiation is not particularly relevant in a new market um, and because it's, it's a market that's about learning and you have to learn and then you may, may make sense to differentiate. So differentiation doesn't really matter. I don't think RBV matters very much, um, you know, resource-based view in a new market. Again, because it's about learning. I think once a firm starts to scale, in fact, in fact I should just say step back on the, on the online fashion study. Uh, that's actually a study of how you actually reach adolescents. And in the first sort of era of the study, when people are figuring out their core transaction, that is, that is not about differentiation, it's not about resource-based view. In contrast, as they start to scale, the resource-based view starts to become important. In fact, I have a new paper that will be coming out in Journal of Management that's about um, then in, in early stage markets, it's, it's much more of a learning, thinking, doing things story that I told today. But as you transition into uh, a growth market, um, it's, it's a combination of building resources and thinking and doing. So resources become interesting when you really are in a scaling growth market. Um, uh, so I would think, so those are two, just to use two, the, the, probably the most prominent paradigms in strategy. Differentiation doesn't matter and resource-based view doesn't really matter if you're talking about a nascent market. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, and we have come to an end. Um, Kathy, on behalf of SMS, and especially the SMS SNE interest group, we would like to offer wholehearted thanks to your presence. Hopefully this is not the last time. Uh, hopefully we'll hear more from you. Um, and to our audience, we will have more talks in the future. Uh, so please be on the lookout for our talks. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, thank you again, Kathy. Yeah, thank you everybody. Thank you for coming.